Hello everybody. In this video I want to talk through the gill structure in a fish. It's part of a unit of work that you study at A-level on gas exchange in organisms. And the fish is really quite unique. Uh, it's a fascinating organism to study. It's a fascinating biological process that takes place over the gills. But it's also one that I find when I do the dissect the fish dissection or fish head dissection with my own students, they're always surprised by the size of the gills and what the actual structure looks like. So I want to start with this uh, quite graphic image. So I ask my own students to I say, show me your best fish face. Uh, and they put their hands over their ears. And what we do is we mimic the structures that you see when you look at the f actual fish. And if you open wide, you can see whilst it's missing in your own mouth, what you've got this in this region here of the fish is a structure that is quite unmistakable. I mean, it looks quite unique. It looks almost like teeth, you could say, because it's got sharp, kind of spiky looking bits. But that is actually part of the gills. It's much easier to see if you look at the operculum and you lift it. The operculum is this uh, sort of slit that you see on the side of the fish's head. If you lift that operculum, you'll be able to see this structure here. And that structure there in red, in the central picture, is the gill. And you can see that it's made up of this bright red area here. Then you've got, if I just draw a black arrow, you've got this sort of like whitish part here. And then if I circle sort of those little spiky parts there. In this video, I'm going to talk you through what all of those different bits are. And we'll talk about gas exchange in a fish in more general terms. So let's talk about ventilation generally in the fish. And I've put up a few notes already uh, just to save a lot of the kind of writing, but I will discuss this. And the two core components that we need to think about when we talk about fish ventilation is this operculum here at the bottom the definition, this slit on the side of the head, if you like, and what's called the buccal floor. When we talk about the buccal floor, we're basically talking about the mouth uh, region. You might be familiar in like forensic sense, we talk about buccal swabs, taking the swab of the inside of your cheek. So the buccal floor, is sort of, buccal relates to mouth ultimately. So when the fish opens the mouth, it lowers the buccal floor. Now, as you can imagine, if I just put an asterisk right here, if we imagine the volume inside of that mouth is going to go up. If the buccal floor rather is lowered, the space inside the mouth is going to get bigger. So the pressure falls. This sounds really familiar to when we talk about ventilation in a human. When we talk about the pressure, for example, uh, falling inside the thoracic cavity in a human. When we're breathing in, when we're inhaling, the volume gets bigger so the pressure falls. Very much like that. Now, when the buccal floor is lowered and the volume in the mouth goes up, the operculum, this flap covering the gills, closes. So think of it almost like a confined space. By closing this operculum, we're keeping the mouth as a confined space and what happens is water will rush in. So water will rush in to the mouth. That's when the fish then closes its mouth or raises the buccal floor. When this buccal floor suddenly raises upwards, the volume inside goes much smaller and quite quickly so. So because the volume inside the fish's mouth has gone down, the pressure as a result goes up and quite quickly. And because of that raise in pressure, the water, as in number three, point three on this uh particular image describes, water gets forced out. So it gets forced out in this direction here, out of the operculum, but crucially over the gills. And gas exchange, which is the crux of today's video, occurs in the gills. So quite simply, just a recap. So you'll lower the buccal floor, open the mouth, the volume goes up, Pressure falls, water rushes in. You suddenly close the mouth and raise the buccal floor back up. And that pressure forces the water out. The operculum opens to allow the water to rush out over the gill. And it's at the gill where gas exchange takes place. So before we get really into the, the idea of gas exchange, let's look more at the actual structure in detail. Okay, so before we get into the deep anatomy, 
what I want to do is to show you this particular exam question. It gets, it gets asked a lot when you teach this topic. And it's about how the gills are actually adapted for efficient gas exchange. Now I will explain, and this will make more sense as we talk through the actual anatomical features. But I just want you to bear in mind that we've got here the idea of large surface area to volume ratio. We've got the idea of thin cells for a short diffusion distance. We've got the idea of maintaining concentration gradients. So this all relates back to Fick's law. And Fick's law states that the rate of diffusion is proportional to surface area times concentration gradient divided by diffusion distance. So when we look at the gas exchange uh, structure for a fish, be thinking about diffusion and how these relate to it. So the large surface area to volume ratio allows more diffusion. Membranes are permeable, so we've got diffusion of gases faster because ultimately we're trying to get oxygen to move from the water into the blood supply of the fish. We've got thin cells, so every, all the cells that I talk about uh, in the rest of the video are thin to keep the diffusion distance nice and short. And there is a good vascular or blood supply, and that's all about maintaining concentration gradients, which we'll talk about in more detail. Just uh, one particular exam point to raise here. Often when you're asked to describe and explain how a gill uh, structure is adapted to carry out its function, a lot of students often just say there's a there's gill filaments or gill lamellae as they're called and so there's a large surface area and that is true but what you need to say is that there are many gill filaments and you're going to see that in the picture that's just about to pop up. So apologies if you're a little bit squeamish but here what we've got are a handful of uh, anatomical photos showing these actual structures inside the fish. So the gills are, as it says up at the bottom, just I've highlighted a few key notes at the bottom, are made up of gill filaments. Gill filaments are highlighted by, and I'll just highlight these in red, number one here on the diagram. So number one here. These are the gill filaments. And you can see they're just like long, if I just draw the lines in red here, you can see they're just long thread-like structures here, all stacked next to one another. They all attach to the gill arches. Now on a previous image I said it was the white portion. I think it was the first image that I showed you. And that on this diagram, I'll highlight it, is shown by number three. So just here, you can see they're all attached. And number three here. Think of it, now it's odd, but the analogy I use with my students is think of it but like a comb. Number three, this gill arch, or gill bar, as it's often described, you can see that at the bottom as well in the text, is kind of like the side, the edge of the comb, if you like, and the actual combs, the prongs that come off it, are these gill filaments. And the whole point of the gill arch, or the gill bar, is to provide support for the gills. These little spiky bits, I'll just highlight in green, that's number two here. These spiky bits, so you can see, We'll talk about those, just highlight them a little bit clearer there. They are simply gill rakers. Small little appendages found along the front edge of the gill arch or the gill bar. Now at right angles to the gills are the gill lamellae, which increase the surface area. And that's what I was just referring to with the previous exam question. So what you want to say, there are many gill lamellae that make up the gills and that's all about increasing the surface area for gas exchange. This picture that I'm about to move to, I think, will show this a little bit clearer. OK, so what we've got here, if we look at diagram A, we can see, in fact, what I'll do is I'll just draw in in red here where the operculum would be. So we've cut the operculum away and we're exposing the inner gill structure. We can see we've got the gill arch here. And attached to the arch are those gill filaments, this red fanning out kind of uh, thread-like structures. If we look at image B, where we've kind of zoomed in or magnified the image, it's much, much clearer to see. We've got the gill arch here, this whole portion providing support and structure. We've got the gill rakers. These rakers, so I'll just draw with red arrows, these are simply made of cartilage, these little appendages. This is beyond the typical uh, A-level specification, but I thought it's interesting to add. These small little cartilaginous 
uh, appendages are simply for filtering food. They prevent food particles passing into the gill structure, damaging the filaments. So a little bit of extra info there. But then what's really crucial are, and I'll just highlight them in here, are these filaments with lamellae. So this here is one filament, large filament, but you can see lamellae, they look like discs almost running or spanning across the whole length of the filament. That's purely designed to increase surface area. And then if we look at diagram C, we can really see what's going on. We can see that the water is flowing in one direction, here, but the blood is flowing in another. And this leads on to something called the counter current flow or counter current mechanism. There's a reason why water flow is in the opposite direction to the blood flow. Now there's quite a lot of information on this particular screen here so I want to talk through quite slowly to explain what is actually going on. We're going to take the uh, bottom image first. It's actually easier to describe the bottom image. So let's just highlight some key things and the thing I want to highlight here is this term parallel flow. It's the idea that water and, and the water and the blood would be flowing in the same direction. Now this doesn't happen in the fish but I want to start by explaining why this isn't the normal mechanism which you might expect to be the case. Look at this value here that I'm just circling the number eight. So as it says here, numbers just represent relative oxygen concentration. So we've got eight, it's just a relative number of oxygen in the water, three in the blood. We've got a concentration gradient set up. Water moves from where, or rather than water, oxygen will diffuse from where there's a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So the oxygen gas will simply diffuse from the water into the blood, from the blue line to the red one. But then if we look, we've got six and a four. We still have a concentration gradient set up, but here, and I'll highlight this in red to really make the point, when we reach equilibrium, so there is the same amount of oxygen, or same concentration rather, of oxygen in the water and the blood, there is nothing moving. So for the entire duration of the rest of this pathway, this whole filament, no oxygen is moving. So what we've done is reach equal saturation. So after this, as it says, just at this point here in the notes, blood is unable to pick up any more oxygen from the water. There is no concentration gradient. And that is why this is not the mechanism that fish use for gas exchange. They use at the top of the screen something called the counter current flow. Now this counter current flow is really important. I'm going to highlight the most important reason why fish employ this method and it's because a diffusion gradient is maintained all the way across the gill lamellae. You can see when you look at the values here, if I just highlight them, at every single point with the blood and the water moving in opposite directions there is always more oxygen in the water than there is relative to the blood. There is always a concentration gradient set up as it says in the notes just there with the black arrow. There is always this concentration gradient. So fish employ this counter current mechanism where the water and the blood flow in opposite directions. There is always a higher concentration of oxygen in the water relative to the blood. So a concentration gradient is maintained across the whole length of the gill filament. Those last three sentences that I just said are the three marks that are required in the exam question about countercurrent flow. It's always the same. They always ask it as a three marker question. Describe the mechanism of countercurrent flow in fish. And you just need to say those three points. So I'll just highlight them again. That the water and the blood flow in opposite directions. There is always more oxygen or more higher concentration of oxygen in the water than in the blood. So the diffusion gradient is maintained across the whole length of the gill filament. So there in this video we've just talked about the gas exchange system, the gills, in the fish. I hope that helps.